Okay, thank you. Today I'm here to announce Bill 32, the Financial Statutes Amendment Act. This omnibus legislation includes several changes designed to move forward on some mandate items and would allow us to more effectively meet the needs of Albertans. The Financial Statutes Amendment Act proposes the following changes. Introducing alternative finance mortgages. If passed, we'd be the first jurisdiction in Canada to make legislative changes so financial institutions that wish to offer halal financing in Alberta to do so. Standardizing indexation formulas across government. Implementing a new legislative framework that would improve consistency and flexibility as government continues to respond to inflationary and other pressures. Implementing the electric vehicle tax we announced in budget 2024. Ensuring those families tragically affected by the loss of a child receive the Alberta Child and Family Benefit for an extra six months after their child has passed. And lastly, some minor technical tax amendments. Back in the spring of 2023, Premier Smith announced that we'd be exploring opportunities to expand access to halal financing and alternative financing option for housing purchases. Alternative finance mortgages would be open to all eligible customers, regardless of faith, and are bound by all the same legal requirements as traditional mortgages. We are not requiring any financial institutions to implement alternative financing models, but clearing the way for any who wish to offer these models to do so. The second proposed change in this bill would standardize and provide consistency across government when it comes to indexation. Currently, there are multiple formulas for indexing rates, and this will ensure we use a single rate across all ministries. Amounts would increase by 2% for 2025, which is in line with inflation. Under the new approach, government would have added flexibility to consider factors in addition to inflation in setting annual enhancements. It would allow government to continue to make annual adjustments and give it the flexibility to respond to emerging priorities. The third set of changes would establish the electric vehicles tax we announced earlier this year. The tax would be set at $200 annually, which is in line with what drivers of a typical internal combustion engine vehicle pay in fuel tax. A growing number of jurisdictions across North America are introducing electric vehicle taxes, and this is a fair way to ensure these taxes are applied to all drivers. Next, this bill proposes a change to the Alberta Child and Family Benefit to help parents at a time when they might need it, mo need it the most. Amendments would ensure bereaving parents continue to receive Alberta Child and Family Benefit payments for six months after the death of their child instead of stopping the month following the death. This aligns with similar federal changes to the Canada Child Benefit. There is no greater tragedy than the death of a child and our hearts go out to all the families and loved ones grieving these losses. Through these amendments, we hope we can help ease some of the financial burden on families affected by these losses. And Minister Turton will have more to say on that in a moment. The final amendment is a necessary housekeeping matter. It would ensure Alberta's taxation of multi-jurisdictional split income aligns with the requirements of the Federal Provincial Tax Collection Agreement. There's a lot packed into this bill, but it's all part of a larger plan to make tangible and practical changes that benefit this province today and into the future. It moves the dial further in a positive direction so that we can create positive and sustainable changes across government programs. Uh, thank you. I'll turn it over to Minister Churton. Well, thank you very much, Minister Horner, and thank you everyone for coming here today. I'm honoured to join my colleague here to, today to speak to important changes to the Alberta Child and Family Benefit that, if passed, will offer a measure of comfort to families in their darkest moments. The Alberta Child and Family Benefit plays a key role in making life better for our more vulnerable families by helping them provide a better quality of life for their children amid the rising cost of living, supporting their well-being, and empowering families to join the workforce. Tax-free and paid to lower-income families with children and youth under 18 years of age, it benefits more than 180,000 families in Alberta. The amount they receive varies based on their income and the number of children they have in their home. For example, a working family with two children could receive just over $3,600 per year. But at present, that ends when a child or youth passes away. Our government recognizes that the unimaginable loss of any child, no matter the reason, comes with many challenges. 
It's a tragedy no parent should ever have to experience, and we understand that families need time to grieve and process that sorrow. That's why we're, we're proposing changes that, if passed into legislation, will ensure parents continue to receive the Alberta Child and Family Benefit for six months without interruption after the loss of a child. This is a small way we can continue to support families during a profoundly difficult time in their lives and to help ease some of the financial burden on those affected by the passing of a child. These proposed extension amendments would align with similar federal changes under the Canada Child Benefit Program and have no impact on how the benefit is paid. I know these proposed changes will be appreciated by those experiencing the loss of a child and our hearts go out to you, your loved ones and your community. Thank you. Thank you, Ministers. That concludes the speaking portion. We're going to move to the media Q&A. Please state your name and your outlet. We will go with one question, one follow-up. Go ahead, Catherine. Okay, Catherine Murkowski, Alberta Today. I'm wondering, on the uh, Fuel Tax Act amendments, did you consider scrapping the provincial gas tax and making everybody just pay that $200 a year, or why did you decide to go with this $200 tax on EVs? Well, we, we did a cross-jurisdictional scan and saw what was being done uh, elsewhere. I think at the time uh, we were working on this, 44 U.S. states had gone in this direction in some regard. Uh, so it was important for us to use, uh, you know, the what the average Albertan would likely pay in fuel tax to set the parameters of this. Uh, but the fuel tax works very well. Um, you know, you pay more if you drive more. So I think it... Uh, it, it's very practical in the way that it's it's set up, and we're just trying to align this with that, not the other way around. Do you follow up, Catherine? Yeah, so on indexation, it seems like uh, it's entirely possible that uh, if, if inflation is lower than 2%, people will see their payments go up by less than 2%. If it's, say, 3.5% inflation, uh, it'll be lower for them. So it seems like, it, and then there's this also, this regulation, you can set whatever number you like. So it seems like uh, people may be losing out on, on some money here. So why not just stick with CPI for all of these programs? Well, the challenge that we, we have and have had, and that came clear last year with the Premier, was that you know, you had many different um, processes ending in different months. We had programs that used January, some were contemplating June in the fall. So we wanted a standardized process across the board, but with the discretion uh, to, you know, look at any, any factor. So these two rates, this is just the default setting. Uh, Treasury Board will look at it every fall and make a determination. Go ahead, Matt. Uh, I just want to be absolutely clear on the AFM stuff. Um, so I'll ask you to explain to me like I'm five. Uh, just, uh, you know, how it'll work and how it's different than traditional financing. Sure. So what we're doing is making amendments to uh, the Credit Union Act and the, and the ATB Act. And, and really what it comes down to is, is allowing, um, instead of being charged interest, the institution can charge profit or rent and making sure the legislation uh, and regulation enables that. Okay. Is there any thought on uh, how many people might pursue this? Do you guys have an estimate or anything? Uh, the department uh, may have an idea. I would say that um, globally there's major uptake. I think that's why the financial institutions came to us and said, hey, would you consider this? We think there's an appetite for it, uh, but I couldn't give you an, an accurate number. Sure. Thank you, Sean Scalzi with CTV News Edmonton. Apologies, both of my questions are unrelated to today's legislation. I just wanted to follow up on something uh, mentioned over the weekend um, by the Premier in her keynote on Saturday. While discussing the upcoming budget, Smith said, quote, our goal as a government is to help Albertans deal with the federal liberal NDP inflation crisis by implementing the full 750 per taxpayer personal income tax cut promised in the PAX election. Does that mean there's a possibility that this income tax could be rolled up in full in the next budget based on what she said? And how do you round that with talk of possible deficits last week? It's, it's, to answer your first question, it is possible that it would be announced fully in Budget 25. I'll commit to you that it will be clear in Budget 25. Um, Cabinet hasn't uh, discussed that in detail. We will have to wait to see the rest of the uh, budget proposals, but it's certainly possible. I guess I would say, as far as your question about defending it or how do you, you know, square that circle. I would say it would come down to if we feel that 
um, you know, the balance sheet of the province is stronger than the balance sheet of the Albertans that are asking for this and saying, you said you'd do this, why aren't you? you have a follow yeah, as a follow-up, again, unrelated to that one, but looking south to the U.S. election, I'm wondering which candidate you think would be more beneficial or favorable to Alberta's economy and what concerns you might have given Trump's uh, announcements that he would be putting forward these wide tariffs as well as renegotiating trade agreements. Well, I think any any trade talk regarding the U.S. definitely gets our attention, as it as it should. I think it's been made clear that uh, that uh, the USMCA will be looked at in great detail in 2026, regardless of who wins. Uh, so I, I wouldn't speculate beyond that, other than to say we're happy to work with whoever wins. You know, there are, most of our exports uh, go there, as everyone knows. They're very important to our economy overall. So. We'll, we'll be there the day after to work with whoever uh, comes out the other side. Go ahead, Janet. Um, I'm hearing this justification of, about limiting indexation as, oh, well, we're standardizing. But, I mean, your government made a huge deal about re-indexing after that indexation pause. So, um, if, how do you explain this to people who are already having trouble making ends meet, that, that the most increase they're going to see these benefits is 2%, possibly less if CPI is lower. It's 2% for this year. That decision's been made, which closely aligns with inflation. How would I would explain this is, how do you explain it now to someone that's using a program that's getting a different rate than someone else that's get, having another program? We think it's defensible that it's all the same. What kind of position is the Treasury in that you feel like you have to limit this? Because I believe it was in the 6% range, right, this, this year for the increase. So um, how much, how worried are you about the province's finances that you're reeling this back? Well, I, I wouldn't say we're reeling it back because this is just the default. It has to be looked at every, every year. If no decision is made, this is the default that applies. But you're not indexing it to CPI. You're indexing it to whichever is lower, 2%. The default. And then it could be topped up for a myriad of reasons by Treasury Board or government of the day. Uh, the, what was the second part? Your second question, though? Wasn't there another part? I asked like four questions. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, I, I would say, yo, the Treasury. You asked about this, the state, the state yeah. of the Treasury. I would just say I'm, I'm always concerned about that. That's what this job um, entails. But I'd say, you know, this is a, this is a $200 million uh, cost to government, and we're prepared to do that. I think that shows our commitment, even though we're in a, a challenging time. So every year there's going to be a process where you say, okay, at the next year, it will be part of the budget process. Will you look at what uh, that rate will be, should, if it should be higher than 2%? It will be in the fall because CRA needs to be notified. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Uh, so for benefits, I understand that um, if inflation rate is at Bank of Canada target or below, so 2%, it's going to be indexed. But if it's higher, so when the cost of living crisis, the cost of living stings Albertans the most, that's when it won't be indexed. So why do that? It, like I said, it's default, so I'm, I wouldn't say that it won't be. It's that that consideration would be made by, by government. You know, you could look at this the other way. It gives government discretion to maybe use this as a tool. If you were in a crisis situation, maybe it's more efficient to provide relief in this regard than it is to, say, have affordability payments. It gives gives that kind of flexibility to government to use this in a myriad of ways. You have a follow-up? Yeah, for halal mortgages, I understand that... It it's already kind of available to some organizations or companies, uh, the type of lending without interest but with fees instead. So what will change in practice for people who want to get that type of mortgage? Well, I think this is the first time a, uh, a credit union or the ATB would be able to offer that product. Uh, currently, it is offered uh, by some entities, like you said. Uh, they're not uh, deposit-taking corporations. I think that would be the difference. Um, so hopefully it's just more availability, allow more people to potentially get into home ownership. That's, that's the goal. Do you still have a question, Jack? They both got taken. I, Go ahead, I, going back to indexation, our favorite topic, it appears. Um, what would your message be to Albertans who are looking for 
the assurances, like right now we, we know what 2025 is going to look like, but what would your message be to Albertans who are using those benefits and maybe they're going to get at least 2%, it sounds like, but not able to plan? Well, I think the assurance would be that this is a, a default. So, you know, when I look at this, you know, government would have always had the potential to make changes, but they would be, you know, cumbersome. This involves seven or nine pieces of, of legislation. So I think the commitment would be that we want this default setting. We could have made it zero potentially and just made it all discretionary. But I think this should show people out there that we're committed to the program. And are you able to be nimble enough to react to that if you're saying it's every fall? Like, does that allow the nimbleness required if inflation fluctuates? Well, I, I think so. Inflation is generally calculated year over year in one way or another, so I think you have to pick a point. That was part of our challenge before. You can't have January and June and September or you get uh, the situation we were in. All right. So if there are no more questions on the floor. We're going to go to the phones. Operator, can you put through our first caller? We do not have any questions on the line. Go ahead, Jack. Yeah, really quick one then. Um, do you have like, any indication that like Service Credit Union or ATV is actually going to offer these products? Well, I, I don't really like to get into the detail of, of you know, the, the specific institutions, but I would say that um, they came to us in a large way. So they've, there's already been some investments made in, in IT and systems that would be required, so I think that shows that they're very committed to this process. And as another quick follow, can you explain like the subsidiary part of this and essentially why that's needed? Um, without getting into too much detail, I'd say that when through this mass consultation that the department did, it was found that that may um, that may be the best path to reach some of the uh, theological considerations of who's offering this product. Just once, Janet. <laughs> Why are government vehicles exempt from the EV uh, registration fee? Uh, well, I think it comes down to the fact that they're only registered once as opposed to registered annually. Some of that was the practical implications of how to, you know, make this a fair tax. But Thanks, everyone. Merci.